Jack the Ripper is an unidentified serial killer that was active in the impoverished areas around Whitechapel in the autumn of 1888. Attacks attributed to Jack the Ripper involved female prostitutes who lived and worked in the slums of the East End of London. Their throats were cut prior to abdominal mutilations. The removal of internal organs from at least three of the victims led to the belief that their killer may have had some anatomical or surgical knowledge. The name, Jack the Ripper, originated from a letter written by an individual claiming to be the murderer that was disseminated in the media. The letter is believed to have been a hoax and may have been written by a journalist to increase interest in the story and improve their newspaper's circulation. Extensive newspaper coverage gave widespread and international notoriety on the killer. The police in London investigated a series of 11 different murders committed in the Whitechapel area between 1888 and 1891 but were unable to connect all the killings conclusively to the murders committed in 1888. Five victims, Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly, are known as the Canonical Five, and their murders are often considered the most likely to be linked. In the late 19th century, Britain experienced an influx of immigrants who swelled the populations of the major cities, including the East End of London. The Whitechapel area in London's East End became increasingly overcrowded, with the population increasing to approximately 80,000 by 1888. Work and housing conditions worsened, and a large economic underclass developed. Robbery, violence, and alcohol dependency were became commonplace, and the poverty that ensued drove many women to prostitution to survive. In October 1888, London's Metropolitan Police Service estimated that there were over 60 brothels and approximately 1,200 women working as prostitutes in Whitechapel. The murderous reign of Jack the Ripper began when the body of Mary and Nichols was discovered at about 3.40 a.m. on Friday the 31st of August 1888 in Bucks Row, now Derwood Street, in Whitechapel. Her throat was severed by two deep cuts, one of which completely severed all the tissue down to the vertebrae. The lower part of her abdomen was partly ripped open by a deep, jagged wound, causing her bowels to protrude. One week later, on the 8th of September 1888, the body of Annie Chapman was discovered at approximately 6 a.m. near the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street. As in the case of Mary and Nichols, her throat was severed by two deep cuts. Her entire abdomen had been cut open, with a section of the flesh from her stomach being placed upon her left shoulder and another section of skin and flesh, plus her small intestines, being removed and placed above her right shoulder. Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes were both killed in the early morning hours of the, the 30th of September 1888. Stride's body was discovered at approximately 1 a.m. in Duckfield's Yard, off Burner Street, now Henriquez Street, in Whitechapel. The cause of death was a single clear-cut incision, measuring 6 inches across her neck which had severed her left carotid artery and her trachea before terminating beneath her right jaw. The absence of any further injuries to her body has led to uncertainty as to whether Stride's murder was committed by the Jack the Ripper, or whether the killer was interrupted during the attack. Several witnesses later informed police they had seen Stride in the company of a man close to Burner Street earlier, but each gave differing descriptions. Some said that her companion was fair, others dark, some said that he was shabbily dressed, others well dressed. Edoza's body was found in a corner of Mitre Square about three quarters of an hour after the discovery of the body of Elizabeth Stride. Her throat was severed from ear to ear and her abdomen ripped open by a long, deep and jagged wound before her intestines had been placed over her right shoulder, with a section of intestine being completely detached and placed between her body and left arm. Her face had been disfigured, with her nose severed, her cheek slashed, and cuts vertically incised through each of her eyelids. The police surgeon who conducted the post-mortem upon Edoza's body stated his opinion these mutilations would have taken, at least five minutes, to complete. The last victim attributed to Jack the Ripper was Mary Jane Kelly who was discovered lying on the bed in the single room where she lived at 13 Millers Court, off Dorset Street, at 10.45 a.m. on the 9th of November 1888. Her face had been mutilated beyond recognition, with her throat severed down to the spine, and the abdomen almost emptied of its organs. 
Historically, it is believed that the five canonical murders were committed by the same perpetrator is derived from contemporary documents which link them together to the exclusion of others. In 1894, Sir Melville McNaughton, Assistant Chief Constable of the Metropolitan Police Service and Head of the Criminal Investigation Department, wrote a report that stated, the Whitechapel murderer had five victims, and five victims only. A large team of policemen conducted house-to-house -house inquiries throughout Whitechapel. Forensic material was collected and examined. Suspects were identified, traced, and either examined more closely or eliminated from the inquiry. Modern police work follows the same pattern. More than 2,000 people were interviewed, upwards of 300 people were investigated, and 80 people were detained. The investigation was initially conducted by the Metropolitan Police Whitechapel, H, Division Criminal Investigation Department headed by Detective Inspector Edmund Reed. After the murder of Nichols, Detective Inspector Frederick Aberline was sent from Central Office at Scotland Yard to assist. Butchers, slaughterers, surgeons, and physicians were suspected because of the manner of the mutilations. A surviving note from Major Henry Smith, acting commissioner of the city police, indicates that the alibis of local butchers and slaughterers were investigated, with the result that they were eliminated from the inquiry. The concentration of the killings around weekends and public holidays and within a short distance of each other has indicated to many that the Ripper was in regular employment and lived locally. Others have opined that the killer was an educated upper-class man, possibly a doctor or an aristocrat who ventured into Whitechapel from a more well-to-do area. Such theories draw on cultural perceptions such as fear of the medical profession, a mistrust of modern science, or the exploitation of the poor by the rich. There are many, varied theories about the actual identity and profession of Jack the Ripper, but authorities are not agreed upon any of them, and the number of named suspects reaches over 100. Despite continued interest in the case, the Ripper's identity remains unknown. The Dear Boss letter was received by the Central News Agency and was forwarded to Scotland Yard on the 29th of September 1888. Initially, it was considered a hoax, but when it was, was found three days after the letter's postmark with a section of one ear obliquely cut from her body, the promise of the author to clip the lady's ears off gained attention. Edo's ear appears to have been nicked by the killer incidentally during his attack, and the letter writer's threat to send the ears to the police was never carried out. The name, Jack the Ripper, was first used in this letter by the signatory and gained worldwide notoriety after its publication. The Saucy Jackie postcard was postmarked October 1, 1888 and was received the same day by the Central News Agency. The handwriting was similar to the Dear Boss letter, and mentioned the canonical murders committed on September 30th, which the author refers to by writing, double event this time. It has been argued that the postcard was posted before the murders were publicized, making it unlikely that a person would hold such knowledge of the crime. However, it was postmarked more than 24 hours after the killings occurred, long after details of the murders were known and publicized by journalists and had become general community gossip by the residents of Whitechapel. The From Hell letter was received by George Lusk, leader of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, on October 16, 1888. The handwriting and style is unlike that of the Dear Boss letter and Saucy Jackie postcard. The letter came with a small box in which Lusk discovered half of a human kidney, preserved in ethanol. Edoza's left kidney had been removed by the killer. The writer claimed that he fried and ate the missing kidney half. There is disagreement over the kidney, some contend that it belonged to Edoz, while others argue that it was a macabre practical joke. During the course of the investigation of the murders, police regarded several men as strong suspects, though none were ever formally charged. These suspects include Montague John Drew was a Dorsetbourne barrister who worked to supplement his income as an assistant schoolmaster in Blackheath, London, until his dismissal shortly before his suicide by drowning in 1888. His decomposed body was found floating in the Thames near Chiswick in December 1888. Some modern authors suggest that Drew may have been dismissed because he was believed to be homosexual and that this could have driven him to commit suicide. However, both his mother and his grandmother suffered mental health problems, and it is possible that he was dismissed because of an underlying hereditary psychiatric illness. 
His death shortly after the last canonical murder led Assistant Chief Constable Sir Melville McNaughton to name him as a suspect in a memorandum from 1894. Soren Klasowski, aka George Chapman, and no relation to victim Annie Chapman, was born in Congress Poland, but emigrated to the United Kingdom sometime between 1887 and 1888, shortly before the start of the Ripper murders. Between 1893 and 1894 he assumed the name of Chapman. He successively poisoned three of his wives and became known as the Borough Poisoner. He was hanged for his crimes in 1903. At the time of the Ripper murders, he lived in Whitechapel, London, where he had been working as a barber under the name Ludwig Sklosky. However, many disagree that Chapman is a likely culprit, as he murdered his three wives with poison, and it is uncommon, though not unheard of, for a serial killer to make such a drastic change in their modus operandi. Aaron Kosminski was a Polish Jew who was admitted to Coney Hatch Lunatic Asylum in 1891. Kosminski was named as a suspect by Sir Melville McNaughton in his 1894 memorandum and by former Chief Inspector Donald Swanson in handwritten comments in the margin of his copy of Assistant Commissioner Sir Robert Anderson's memoirs. Anderson wrote that a Polish Jew had been identified as the Ripper but that no prosecution was possible because the witness was also Jewish and refused to testify against a fellow Jew. Some authors are skeptical of this, while others use it in their theories. In 1987, author Martin Fido searched asylum records for any inmates called Kosminski, and found only one, Aaron Kosminski. Kosminski lived in Whitechapel, however, he was largely harmless in the asylum. His insanity took the form of auditory hallucinations, a paranoid fear of being fed by other people, and a refusal to wash or bathe. In his book The Cases That Haunt Us, former FBI profiler John Douglas states that a paranoid individual such as Kosminski would likely have openly boasted of the murders while incarcerated, but there is no record that he ever did so. Michael Ostrov was a Russian-born professional con man and thief. He used numerous aliases and assumed titles. Among his many dubious claims was that he had once been a surgeon in the Russian Navy. Researchers have failed to find evidence that he had committed crimes any more serious than fraud and theft. Author Philip Sugden discovered prison records showing that Ostrov was jailed for petty offenses in France during the Ripper murders. John Pizer was a Polish Jew who worked as a bootmaker in Whitechapel. He had a prior conviction for a stabbing offense, and police sergeant William Fick apparently believed that he had committed a string of minor assaults on prostitutes. After the murders of Mary and Nichols and Annie Chapman Thick arrested Pisa, even though the investigating inspector reported that, there is no evidence whatsoever against him. He was cleared of suspicion when it turned out that he had alibis for two of the murders. He was staying with relatives at the time of one of the murders, and he was talking with a police officer at the time of another. Pisa and Thick had known each other for years, and Pisa implied that his arrest was based on animosity rather than evidence. Pisa successfully obtained monetary compensation from at least one newspaper that had named him as the murderer. Francis Tumblety earned a small fortune posing as an Indian herb doctor throughout the United States and Canada, and was commonly perceived as a misogynist and a quack. He was connected to the death of one of his patients, but escaped prosecution. In 1865, he was arrested for alleged complicity in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, but no connection was found and he was released without being charged. Tumblety was in England in 1888, and was arrested apparently for engaging in homosexual acts, which were illegal at the time. Awaiting trial, he fled to France and then to the United States. Already notorious in the States for his self-promotion and previous criminal charges, his arrest was reported as connected to the Ripper murders. American reports that Scotland Yard tried to extradite him were not confirmed by the British press or the London police, and the New York City police said, there is no proof of his complicity in the Whitechapel murders, and the crime for which he is under bond in London is not extraditable. In 1913, Tumblety was mentioned as a Ripper suspect by Chief Inspector John Littlechild of the Metropolitan Police Service in a letter to journalist and author George R. Sims. 
Suspects proposed years after the murders include virtually anyone remotely connected to the case by contemporary documents, as well as many famous names, who were not considered in the police investigation at all. As everyone alive at the time is now dead, modern authors are free to accuse anyone they can, without any need for any supporting historical evidence. Two of these famous suspects include The theory that Prince Albert Victor could be the Ripper was brought to major public attention in 1970 when an article by Thomas E. Stoll was published in The Criminologist that revealed his suspicion that Clarence had committed the murders after being driven mad by syphilis. The suggestion was widely dismissed, as Albert Victor had strong alibis for the murders, and it is unlikely that he suffered from syphilis. Stoll later denied implying that Clarence was the Ripper, but efforts to investigate his claims further were hampered, as Stoll was elderly, and he died from natural causes just days after the publication of his article. The same week, Stoll's son reported that he had burned his father's papers, saying, I read just sufficient to make certain that there was nothing of importance. Sir William Wythe Gull was physician in ordinary to Queen Victoria. He was named as the Ripper as part of the evolution of the widely discredited Masonic royal conspiracy theory outlined in such books as Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution. Coachman John Netley has been named as his accomplice. Thanks to the popularity of this theory among fiction writers and for its dramatic nature, Gull shows up as the Ripper in a number of books and films including the 1988 TV film Jack the Ripper starring Michael Caine, Alan Moore, and Eddie Campbell's graphic 1999 novel From Hell, and its 2001 film adaptation, in which he and Home plays Gull. Conventional historians have never taken Gull seriously as a suspect due to sheer lack of evidence. In addition, he was in his 70s at the time of the murders and had recently suffered a stroke. The nature of the Ripper murders and the impoverished lifestyle of the victims drew attention to the poor living conditions in the East End of London and galvanized public opinion against the overcrowded, unsanitary slums. In the two decades after the murders, the worst of the slums were cleared and demolished, but the streets and some buildings survived. Today, the legend of Jack the Ripper lives on and is still promoted by various guided tours of the murder sites and other locations pertaining to the case.